So thanks for everybody for, for being here. Uh, I hope this is a, a great experience for, uh, for all of you. And we're just looking forward to, uh, to a good time talking about leadership uh, tonight. So when I think about leadership in healthcare, uh, one thing that I know is that dentists, physicians, and healthcare professionals really don't have any interest in studying leadership and diving into it. I know that from my personal experience in just observing dentists, um, we're certainly trained well in a lot of areas. That's just not one of them. But the other thing that I know is that uh, all practice owners, healthcare professionals, dentists and physicians want the results that great leadership brings. And that's really what we're gonna talk about tonight uh, is something about the results. So when, when I started this journey of uh, working on this particular webinar, I did an Amazon search uh, for leadership books and I got 70,000 results from just a simple Amazon search for leadership books. So that tells me a couple of things. One thing it tells me is that the interest level for leadership training, leadership knowledge, leadership development is off the charts. It also tells me that the satisfaction level with people looking for better leadership is low because they're still looking, because there's still books being written and sold. I own a lot of those books. I've read a lot of those books and benefited from those books. Uh, but I also know that leadership is really not uh, a checklist or the five easy steps of how to become a great leader, an effective leader. But that's really what most people are looking for when, uh, when they're clicking on uh, Amazon looking for a leadership book. So we're going to probe a little bit deeper into you and I tonight to find out uh, really where leadership lives. My good friend and, and partner, Joel Small, and I uh, formed Line of Sight Coaching this year for the express intent of helping um, leaders develop. Because we know that, uh, that leadership is critical uh, in practice development and practice performance. And we really know uh, from our training, from our experience, that the ceiling of performance for an individual and, and for their practice or their organization is the ceiling of the leader. And so <clears throat> that's really what drives uh, our uh, efforts at building Line of Sight Coaching. And the name itself was uh, chosen. Joel and I spent a lot of time uh, developing that name just because it reflects clarity, which is one of the most important things uh, for leaders or for effective leadership. So as we were um, looking and learning about leadership, the first thing that came to mind was great leaders build strong cultures. And, and when we look at strong cultures, we know that strong cultures build performance and that performance uh, in turn builds profit and enjoyment. So how do we know that? Well, we know that because there's been a lot of research done and in 1992, Harvard Business School professor, James Heskert, uh, did a study with a partner of over 200 companies that in respect to um, what was their corporate culture like. And so when they compared 12 companies that had a really strong corporate culture to 20 companies that had average or poor corporate cultures, what they found was over time, the strong cultures produce 756% more net income growth than the average culture. And that's an extraordinary number. It also showed up in other financial metrics, but what we know is that leadership and the strong cultures that come from leadership uh, pay, not just with profit, but also with pleasure, enjoyment, the rewards that we're looking for. So, how we view it is building great leaders uh, that build strong cultures is our primary, um, our primary work. And what I would suggest to you is that our culture, the practice culture that we live and work in is really uh, our, our most competitive advantage. In other words, it's a thing that can set us apart and help us to get to where we want to go. So the reason that that we see it more important now than maybe 
20, 30 years ago is that the marketplace is just much more complex than it used to be. And the best definition that we've found of that uh, is an acronym, acronym called VUCA. So number one, the volatility of the marketplace is, I think, at unprecedented levels. And that just means to me the rate of change, uh, the amount of change, and then all of the things that we face are much more volatile than they were um, 20, 30 years ago. And within that volatility, certainly there's opportunity uh, for growth, but it's still a more challenging environment. The uncertainty, absolute uncertainty between all the players in dentistry uh, really makes it a different place. And the complexity, my goodness, if we just think about all the complexity that we face from uh, the competitive nature of the marketplace to technology and what and how we incorporate technology into our practice, what our ownership models look like, what do reimbursement models look like, um, all of the HR aspects of uh, owning a business and the, the legal aspects of owning a business and running that business and being compliant, all of that adds up to really unprecedented complexity, I think. And then finally, ambiguity. It's, it's like you just look at all these different factors and ask the question, you know, where do I even begin to think about how do I develop myself as a leader and how do I develop my practice? So <clears throat> I think the VUCA really drives some of those 70,000 books that we find on Amazon. And it, it leads me to this question. And I think it's a great question for today since our subject is the promise of leadership. And the question is, what is it about me that makes somebody want to follow? And, you know, that is not a, a, a simple or a easy question, but I think it is the essential question uh, of a leader. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to keep that in mind as we walk through uh, this leadership journey here in the next 30 to 45 minutes. And so when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about this definition of leadership. There are many definitions of leadership, but this is the one that I enjoy the most and, and feel like it speaks to me the most. And that is the deployment of self into circumstances. Um, and, and so the question's going to come up as we are deployed into the circumstances of our life and our practice, what self are you going to deploy? Now that sounds like a, a, a silly question in a lot of ways, but really it's the question about who shows up in the, in the moments of your life and practice, the big moments, the small moments, the everyday moments, because that's really the question of leadership. So I'm gonna propose to you that it's possible in 2020 to make a decision to decide, I'm gonna deploy my best self but I've just got to figure out what that self is and how to get it there. So, so when we're thinking about that, I think about the essential uh, characteristics of a great leader, and that is uh, a leader shows up with clarity, conviction, courage, and compassion. And all of those traits are really not traits that live at the surface of a leader, they really come from depth. They come from the inner game. And it, they come out and they show up when somebody has spent the time on their inner game to really develop that. And I don't pretend that they're easy or that it's easy to be crystal clear about what your destination is and to have conviction about it and to exercise the courage that it takes to act upon it. And at the same time, to have compassion for the people that are traveling with you but, uh, but I think that those are the best descriptors of a great leader. So that brings me to a story. Uh, and, and I'm going to try to interwine a few stories along the way tonight. But I think all of us that are participants of or in the family of the Panky Institute or fans of it, we know a little bit about uh, the story of L.D. Panky, but I want to bring it back up to light to make some points to you. So, so Dr. Panky, as you all know, had a practice in Kentucky, and that practice uh, was actually very successful. He was paying down loans. He was financially successful. He was doing what dentists did in his time frame. 
but it wasn't rewarding to him and it was greatly disappointing uh, pointing to him. So he made a decision and he got really clear about what he was going to do and what he was not going to do. And, and that was, he was going to save teeth and re rehabilitate mouths and he was going to stop extracting teeth and, and moving in the opposite direction. And then he developed the conviction to act on that and the courage to do it. Moves to Coral Gable, Florida, starts a practice. And the context of all this was he didn't know how to do what he had decided to do. And the, nobody did. There was not the technology. There was not the, um, there, was, there was not the means. There wasn't the experience. There wasn't anything. He was going to have to be a part of the development of that. But because he had the courage, because he had the conviction, and because he was crystal clear about where he wanted to go, what happened? Well, what happened is the same thing that would happen to any of us today that developed those same traits. The, the resources that he needed, the people that he needed, the training that he needed, all began to come into his life and step-by-step, day-by-day developed for Dr. Pankey. And he was doing all of this at the worst economic time period uh, in the last two or 300 years, maybe ever in, in the United States and during the Great Depression. So I want you to think about that for a second, uh, about what it would take to, in spite of the economics and the lack of knowledge, to be able to go forward that way. But that was Dr. Pankey's story. So... <clears throat> So as that story unfolded, we can look backward now and say that those qualities of leadership in Dr. Pankey resulted in a life that's influenced thousands, uh, thousands of uh, dentists all over the world. And so I think I have a technical problem here. Let me see if I can get the slide back up. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Sorry for that uh, technical glitch. So with Dr. Pankey's story, uh, it could be any of your stories of, uh, of how your practice and your life goes forward. Um, <clears throat> so in what Dr. Pankey did, he was making promises, promises to uh, himself, promises to the most important people of the life, as it turns out, promises to the profession. So a great context for leadership comes from, from the science of leadership. Uh, and, and in that science of leadership, as developed by Anderson and Adams in their books, uh, Mastering Leadership and Scaling Leadership, four universal promises come out that I think are really helpful for us to take a look at. So promise number one uh, of a leader to the people following is to set the right direction and create meaningful work. Uh, and I think that's pretty clear. Number two would be to engage all the stakeholders and hold them accountable for performance. The accountability always being key there. And then ensure that the processes, systems, and strategies uh, create or facilitate focus and execution of the organization. It doesn't mean that the leader is responsible to execute all of the strategies, but the leader is the person that has to select them and make a decision that they're appropriate for the practice for the organization. And then finally, to lead effectively. Uh, what is it about effective leadership that maintains relationships of trust uh, in a direction uh, to, to sustain desired results? So let's just take a look at these in a little bit more detail. So, so promise number one is about direction and meeting. And so the way that I see it, this is really where vision, mission, and value show up. Now I'll have to tell you that I know that that sounds not very practical in the sense of, um, of how does that apply to a dental practice. But, <clears throat> but when I have the opportunity to work with Essential One students at the Pankey Institute, they are all working on their dream or their vision. It may not be clear enough, but the inspiration 
piece of it is in place. They want to go someplace. They want to be the best dentist they can be, have the best practice they can be. They want a rewarding and enjoyable career. That's why they became a dentist. So I think that vision is important to all of us. The clearer that it is to us, the more that it is a draw to us, the more it pulls us in that direction. The mission is about what we have to do, uh, what we have to overcome in order to reach the, reach the destination that we call a vision. So it's the meaning maker. So whenever you see a Nike commercial, what are people doing in that commercial? They're, they're lifting weights, they're running, they're doing all kinds of extreme workouts in order to become a better athlete so that they can reach their vision, whatever that is, um, that they're on. That's always a Nike commercial because it's the meaning maker. They're, tr they're trying to tweak our hearts when we're watching that commercial. And then finally, the values are our guides. And for every journey, you need, you need guides that tell you when you're behaving on course and when you're off course. So we call that the behavior maker. So to me, vision, mission, and values are the structure of direction and, and bringing meaning uh, to our work. And it, they're the components of creating what I call a shared mental model. So, so that's a, a, a phrase that I've borrowed from many other people, but it's the idea that if our team, our organization shares a common vision, mission, and values, then it begins to shape us and mold us to where we think alike, we feel alike, we see alike, and that shared mental model becomes the operating system of, uh, of a great culture. Uh, <clears throat> so it is kind of the point in time where you can say one plus one starts to equal three because rather than the leader carrying all of the burden, uh, once he's gotten or she's gotten uh, buy-in to the vision, mission, values, now you're starting to move from compliance to commitment. And that's a huge shift. And there's a lot of power in all that. And now we've got uh, a collective power rather than individual power. So I think vision, mission, values are great structure for promise number one. Promise number two uh, is about the engagement and accountability uh, of our team. And so what I think about there is, the first thing is we have to know our team. And so we know them just by the obvious, and that's by asking questions, listening, observing, sensing, all of the different things that would give us information about who is this person that's on my team that's following me. Because once we really get to know them, then, <clears throat> We can take the gifts and talents they have, and through coaching, I would say coaching as a leadership style, where we help to develop and magnify their gifts. Now we're strengthening the individuals of our team so that they can contribute to the collective. And then <clears throat> from that, we can communicate uh, with our team roles, responsibilities, authorities, and really how is it that they contribute to the vision, mission, values. What role do they have? Why is it significant? Why is it important? Because when that happens, then we've got, again, another step of that commitment and away from compliance. Compliance is going to be the level of performance where we're gonna live in our problems. Commitment's going to give us a chance to live above our problems and it's gonna add a lot of energy and power to, uh, to the team. So when we have that on board and we have an agreed upon vision, mission, and values, then the values begin to take over and they become the boss. And it becomes clear when somebody is living outside the values, including me. So Joel and I have had many conversations about what happens when we tell individually and collectively a team member that we want them to hold us accountable to the promises that we're making to them, to the commitments that we're making, to what we say is important. When we do that and we're giving authority and responsibility for accountability back to individual team members, 
Now, what happens with that person? Well, I mean, they feel empowered because they are empowered and they feel a higher level of commitment and they feel a higher level of ownership. So I think that's a key thing um, in, in the process of leading a, an effective team. The accountability is not just a one-way street of us holding our team accountable. It's actually a two-way street in which they hold us accountable because it all starts and finishes with you and I, the leaders. <clears throat> so when we go on to promise number three, promise number three is about uh, strategy systems and focus. How do we, uh, how do we execute? And so, strategies are really designed to fit your vision or your destination. So what I mean by that is if you're building a practice that is um, a relationship-based practice, if that's what you want, then you need to design processes that are uh, intended to build relationships and depend on relationships. And that's everything from branding to how the new patient enters your practice, to what happens at every appointment, to how you communicate, um, everything like that. So the strategies have to fit. If we wanted a different kind of practice, we would need different strategies in order to move towards, uh, towards our vision. So <clears throat> that's the first thing. The next thing, they need to work. So the systems you have in place need to actually produce results and channel uh, actions and activity in the right direction. And you'll know that. So that if they don't do that, then your role as a leader is to say, I've got to refine, change the process. So the ongoing results create feedback or a feedback loop for you, the leader, to refine and redesign what you're doing. Because without that feedback, how do, you, how do you know whether they're helping you move towards your vision um, or your destination. So finally, um, the first three promises of leadership really are depend on promise number four in order to come to life because without promise number four, um, they don't happen. So promise number four says that we are to maintain relationships of trust in order to achieve and sustain desired results. So that number one builds confidence in all of the team members. Number two, with trust, it frees up people's hearts and minds to commit. In other words, it's safe. It's a safe place to commit to. And that's a huge deal uh, for team because they've had a lot of other experiences. And it forms the basis of a thriving culture where, where people thrive and strive to contribute. And people get honored for their contributions and recognized for that. It is so common that that doesn't happen. And that is so disappointing to, uh, to people and disenfranchising. And in, here's the big one. It's the inherent potential because it's again, um, it's again moving from compliance to commitment because every person on your team and every potential person on your team has hidden talent. They have discretionary energy and passion that they can contribute, but it's not a job requirement. It only comes when they commit. And so the, really the leverage of a leader is right there. When, when the leadership has developed to a point that there's organic, spontaneous um, offering of that hidden talent and that discretionary energy. I think discretionary is a great word there because it's not required to give to have the job. So one of my favorite thought leaders in this area of trust is Oxford professor, Rachel Botsman. And uh, Rachel is just, besides having a beautiful Australian accent, she's just a great thinker. And so how she would uh, think about trust, and I would think about it is trust is the currency of great leaders. And it's really uh, essential. And there, I, I have several favorite definitions of trust, but trust is one of the most difficult things for sociologists to define. Um, but I like the way Rachel talks about it. And she says this, trust is a confident relationship with the unknown. Because I want you to think about if you're, uh, especially if you're a, an Essentials One student and you're really just getting your journey kickstarted, your vision has a lot of unknown with it. 
both in terms of the journey, what's going to be needed, and then what's it exactly going to be like, because you're going to refine that a lot. So in order to invite and attract and keep people with you on this journey, they're going to have to trust you, but they're also going to have to trust that the destination's worth going to. And it's really a question of if, if your life, if your practice, if your career were a story, is this a story worth listening to? Is this a story worth being a part of? Um, and I think that puts a different light on really what vision, mission, and values do for us. So if, if we were to, to think about it in a different way, I really like uh, what Albert Einstein said, that we can't really solve problems from the same level of leadership or the same level of consciousness, consciousness that created them. And what he's saying in a practical way is, is this, what got you here won't get you there. And when, you're, when you have a really strong, compelling vision and you are at one place and you want to be at a much, much better place uh, at the end of your journey, you're going to have to learn how to navigate that and lead in such a way in order to get there. So that's going to require something more of you. So I think what Albert was saying here uh, is really illustrated great by an iceberg. Because when we see the iceberg, we can see the tip of it, which is a very small part of it. And that tip of that iceberg, we're going to call the outer game. It's the visible, it's the discernible, it's the measurable behaviors. When somebody's buying one of those 70,000 leadership books, they're looking for the outer game. How do you go and, and develop your checklist? How do you go through the five easy steps of leadership or whatever? They're looking for that surface level performance changer by looking at the tip of the iceberg. And the reality is the tip of the iceberg isn't where the strength and the power is. The strength and the power is in the base of that iceberg down below the surface of the water that's so massive. And that's really our inner game. And so the inner game would be the emotions uh, that, that we carry. It would be the memories that help develop those emotions. And it would be a lot of structure that we have created, we might call our internal operating system. Like it would include the beliefs that we have, the assumptions that we make, and it would include exactly how we think. What are the pathways of, of thoughts that carry us uh, as we go about what we do? Because that inner game, the base of the iceberg drives the outer game. And so a couple of things to illustrate that was one of the first leadership experiences that Joel and I had together was in a workshop with Dr. Brian DeRoach, a PhD psychologist from Seattle, who's just a brilliant guy. He helped both of us so much. And when I first went uh, to that, it was around the year 2000, and it was at an airport hotel in Seattle because Brian was working with Frank Spear and his workshops. And uh, when I asked Debbie, who was Frank's business manager, after I took facially generated treatment planning, what should I take next? She said, Mac, you should take the leadership workshop. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yes, I'm sure. Give me your American Express card. And so I did, as I did every time. And Debbie was right. I thought this was going to be two and a half days like the books I had read. It was two and a half days of gut-wrenching, soul-searching, inner game developing uh, experiences in which Brian was trying to help us create self-awareness. Self-awareness always measures as the key component of leadership. And so it was a great journey. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't reference it. So that was kind of the beginning point for me of um, thinking about leadership as an inward thing rather than a visible surface kind of thing. I would just add to this image that your inner game kind of swims in or floats in a sea that I call your soul game, or really that's where your most deep, deepest held beliefs are. And those things are really what wraps up around your emotions and your memories. 
And, and so that's the place where faith lives in us. And that's a place where our most deeply held philosophical positions live. And so your emotions and your memories cannot exist without that connection there. And that's the strongest, most powerful driver of anything um, of a leader or an adult. So <clears throat> to just summarize that, uh, leadership consciousness, as Einstein was talking about, just includes meaning-making, decision-making, and values or our spiritual beliefs uh, that drive uh, the outward visible behavior. So <clears throat> when we come to thinking about, okay, leadership is not just a checklist or five easy steps, it's actually about me and I can't avoid myself in, in this journey. Uh, Victor Frankl's quote here is spot on. Victor Frankl being a Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz and, and probably one of my favorite thinkers and writers of all time. And when he said that, you know, when we can't change our circumstances, we're challenged to change ourselves. And when I think about Victor's circumstances at Auschwitz, you know, they're inhuman. He, he had zero control uh, over anything except for his thoughts. And that's where every day, all day long, Viktor Frankl created the life he was going to live after Auschwitz. And that's what he means about challenging um, uh, the, uh, the change in ourselves. So <clears throat> Dr. Pankey would tell us that what he's really speaking to is leadership development and, and adult development are about knowing yourself. And I think what Dr. Pankey was meaning with that uh, was just uh, that, that we need to know ourselves not just at the surface level, but at, uh, at a very deep level. So the rest of, uh, of our time tonight is just gonna be focused on how can we increase our self-awareness uh, so that we know ourselves in a way that we understand how we show up to the most important people in our lives, our family, our team, our patients, our colleagues, all the key people in our life. How do we as a person show up to that? And so uh, a leadership circle profile is an instrument that we use uh, in line of sight coaching that Joel and I use that helps us to understand our clients, but more importantly, it's a way of them understanding themselves. And so what happens in this leadership circle profile is 12 to 15 of the most important people in someone's life agree to do uh, a survey on them or a profile of them. And that is compiled into a report. And the central piece of the report is this graph. So this particular assessment has assessed over 100,000 leaders around the world by over a million and a half people. So the data with this is stunning and it's just uh, extraordinarily beneficial. So what you see in this graph is that there's 18 leaders on the top half in the creative section. Those 18 characteristics are associated with high performing leaders and divided into specific categories. The lower part of the graph or the circle is 11 characteristics associated with low performing leaders. And so as, uh, as this is done, then, um, then you have the chance uh, to, to see how you show up to these 12 to 15 people. And you get to see it specifically And each part of the graph relates to other parts of the graph. So as you look at it, you can see how it affects the, uh, the overall. So if we were as a, an example to look at the relating section on the top left part of the graph, we can see that's exactly across from the controlling section. So the stronger someone's controlling tendencies are, the less effective they're gonna be to relating with people. And so if we saw somebody showing up in a real strong controlling way, then that would be an area of work for them to work on how do they increase their relating skills. By the same token, if we saw somebody showing up in, an, in a complying way and within complying could be passivity, uh, it could be people pleasing, it could be things like that, then that's directly across from achievement and performance. And so oftentimes 
in a complying sense, those people might make complying kind of leadership decisions instead of effective ones. Um, and then in the final section, if we see a protecting um, person, then often they're distant uh, from engaging people and, and distant from the authenticity that they need. So that person in there, uh, we, we uh, can, can take their protecting traits, help them see them, get the self-awareness, and then begin to work on a plan of how do they show up in a more authentic, self-aware kind of way. And I have had clients that have traits uh, all like this in all categories. And it's really, uh, without this self-awareness, it's really, really difficult to make targeted, specific growth developments because uh, it's hard for that person to be clear sometimes and just accept uh, their traits. What you see in this graph too is the dark lines are self-evaluations and then the green shaded areas are, are from the, uh, the surveyors. So, <clears throat> so that particular instrument is really just something that's about knowing yourself and how do you learn to know yourself. There's certainly other ways. And the one thing that I would recommend to everybody is that it's, this is a difficult journey to go on by yourself. I think that, uh, I think that it almost always requires someone to help you, whether that is a coach, whether that is a group, a leadership learning group that you spend time with, whether it's your study club, um, whether it's family, but one way or another, you need people to travel with that can help you to grow in this area. And so there, there are many, many people um, that work in this area that can just be tremendous helps to you. And so that would be my encouragement. So the result of, <clears throat> of all this uh, is, comes back to Viktor Frankl for me. And this is something that has really helped me and helped my growth. And I think helped a lot of, uh, a lot of my clients. And Victor said this, between stimulus and response, in other words, between what happens to you and how you respond to it, there's a space, there's an opportunity to pause. So in that, in that space is that ability to pause and, and to choose something else rather than just to react to it. And in that choice lies our growth and freedom. So as I go through the moment to moment uh, leadership events or just the moment to moment decisions or experiences with my team, I use this all the time. And I ask myself the question, who is it that I want to be in this circumstance? Do I want to revert back to some of my reactive traits that are really just things I learned growing up? Or do I want to choose who it is that I want to be in that space and to be more effective? That's what Victor is saying here. And I think that idea is worth coming to the webinar tonight on uh, just because it's something that you can pull out of your pocket and use every day maybe multiple times a day to begin to live a little bit differently than maybe what you have in the past as a leader so <clears throat> the question here um, is is what i just said who is it that i want to be in this situation and what does that person look like so as we get down towards the end of our time and before we go into, into some q and I wanna, I wanna close out with a couple of stories that illustrate some of the things I talked about here. I know I went quickly through a lot of things and, and so hopefully some of that can come up in the Q&A, uh, but if not, then just email me and I'm happy to, to talk to you about that. So, I think that the biggest thing that I see in people and in myself as I've worked at becoming a better leader and in the last few years of my life, I thought I was really work, working at becoming a better coach through the work uh, with three of my coaches, including Joel, and a lot of training and a lot of reading and a lot of uh, uh, certifications. But really what I was working on becoming was a better Mac because there was still a lot in my leadership game that needed development. And so it reminds me of a story from one of my favorite 
speaker, teacher, preachers, Dr. Tony Evans of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in, in Dallas, Texas. And Tony, for any of you that have ever heard him, is this big, powerful ex-football player, African-American uh, preacher who's just phenomenal, speaks with a really powerful voice. And he tells a story that many of you have heard or heard something like it, but it still communicates really well. And Tony's stories goes like this. He said, when, when an elephant is a baby in a circus, and I'm gonna stop right there and say, I'm not approving of animals and circuses, because I know that's a sensitive subject. It's just part of the story. So when a baby elephant's in a circus, they put a bracelet around his ankle or her ankle, attach it to a chain and a stake, and then that's what keeps that elephant from moving because he can't pull up or she can't pull up the stake to gain his or her freedom. As the elephant grows, the bracelet becomes bigger, but the chain and the stake are the same. And, and, and it still contains now this big, powerful elephant that could easily uproot the stake and, and break the chain, uh, but it doesn't because it's, because it's learned uh, that that chain will bind it, will hold it there. And what Tony says in his story is this, when you know who you are, chains can't bind you. Now, Tony's making a gospel presentation, so he has one idea, but it applies to leadership. And that is, when you know who you are, what's possible for you just explodes right in front of you. Because each of us, I would contend, including me, has chains in our brains. And those chains are beliefs and assumptions and patterns of thought that dictate behavior and performance for us. And, and many of those assumptions and beliefs and patterns of thought are really not true. They're just what we believe are true. So the work of the mission of leadership development for any and all of us is breaking those chains and seeing reality and the truth more for what it is, rather than what we believe this is. This is a story that's played out time and time again. And in Simon Sinek's new book, uh, The Infinite Game, he talks a little bit about that, but mainly he challenges you and I with the question, are you playing a finite game or an infinite game? The infinite game is the game that goes on and on and on, and it requires great leadership. And so what I mean by that is the Panky Institute is playing an infinite game. And that means we know that the game is not gonna be finished when we're gone. It just means the game's gonna go on because our, our mission, our vision, I should say, is, is a very powerful vision down the road of preserving great health care for patients or creating great health care for patients and great practice possibilities for professionals. And it's a, it's a game that's a values-based decision that doesn't have an end to it. We will keep on playing it for as long as we can develop people to keep on playing the game. I think your practice can be like that as well. How is it that you're going to continue um, your vision and what's important to you beyond just this win or lose short-term state of mind that's so common today. So I liked Simon's, uh, I liked Simon's question. So I'm gonna close out with a case study. And it's a case study about the Village Church, which is my church. And no, I'm not gonna preach the gospel to you here. I'm just purely gonna use this as an organizational case study because I think it's extraordinary. So that photograph that you're seeing right now is our actual church campus. That building used to say Albertson's Grocery Store where it says the Village Church right now. So this is a remodeled grocery store <clears throat> that has done so well, grew so fast that, that the leadership of the Village Church decided to expand it and, and create multiple campuses. And it was extraordinarily successful. But after it went on for a while, the leadership of, of the church decided that uh, that, that model was um, not what they intended to do, not what they wanted to do. So, so they, being true to their mission, decided to make some decisions and to... Uh, to sell off, to 
individualized to make each church campus an independent church. And so that meant giving away real estate. It meant giving away equipment. It meant giving away support. It meant, uh, it, it meant everything. Um, and instead of trying to hang on to and build a bigger entity, they were true and are true to their mission of creating church in the way that they felt led to it. Um, <clears throat> so I say this to say that every Sunday when Joanne and I show up there, we got to get there earlier or we don't get a seat. And in spite of starting, I don't know how many churches that, that they've started, and in spite of giving away hundreds and hundreds of people to start churches and untold millions of dollars worth of assets, this church is prospering because they're true to the mission. That's true of the Panky Institute. That's true of your practice, how, uh, how you choose to, to practice. There have been so many times where I wanted to compromise to where I looked around and the models of practice around me were changing so much that I was tempted to change with them. And the points where I wasn't clear were the least successful times uh, of my practice and the least enjoyable time. But once we finally just surrendered to what we wanted to be and got clear about that, it was just like the village church story. Uh, it was being true to the mission and true to the vision, I think, is really where the power is. But the cool thing about all that is, is your vision is unique to you. It's not one that I create, it's one that you create. And what you create is limited only by your ability to think it and to visualize it and to go to work on it. So <clears throat> I have had a, a great time just talking for the last 45 minutes. I'm, I'm starting to see a couple of questions come up here, but if you have, I opened up the Q&A panel. Uh, and, and if anybody has any questions that you want to, uh, to write in or ask, then I'll answer a few and, um, and then we'll finish up. But uh, mainly I just wanna say to you that uh, I love the idea of leadership. I, I think it is the key to whatever it is that you want for your future. Going from where you are to where you wanna be is going to be determined by how powerful a leader that you are. And I think the resources to you and the ability to really grow yourself as a leader, which is essentially growing yourself as an adult, are unlimited. Um, and so I think it's just really uh, up to you. Again, all the literature that we can find and all the experience we have tells us that the ceiling of performance is leadership. And so I think whatever you want to do, there's nothing more important than developing your leadership skills to getting there. When a student decides to come to Essentials One, it sounds like a clinical decision because they're making a decision to train, to train themselves clinically. It's really a leadership decision because they're deciding that they wanna be better than they are, they wanna build their skill sets, have a better future. That's a leadership decision that has a clinical journey. So I put the link up here uh, on, uh, for, for the Panky registration for Essentials One. If anybody is thinking about that and wants to do it, then that's the link. And if you, use, if you do register and you use the code that's there, that's a code that I am able to offer you tonight because you hopped on this webinar and spent some time with us talking about, uh, about leadership. And we would love... Uh, uh, love to see you down there. So feel free to use that uh, link. If you have any questions, call the Institute and, and uh, Alex or somebody would be happy to talk to you about that. So we are right at uh, 7.51 Texas time. Uh, so I'm just a few um, minutes uh, late. Uh, so let me, let me kind of address some of the questions. So one question is, is coaching the most effective for a new practitioner or a more seasoned clinician. So I think it's effective for either one. I think it depends upon what you're looking for. So I think coaching is really about um, a coach holds up a mirror in front of his or her client to help them see themselves uh, clearly, sometimes for the first time, and, and seeing themselves 
more honestly, more clearly, then they begin to um, have the opportunity to grow themselves in new ways. So coach is not going to be a problem solver for, um, for someone. Uh, rather, they're going to be a facilitator that helps somebody um, find the answers that they already have in themselves, whether you're young or old. So I think it depends upon what you want um, and what your goals are. Uh, so I think it's really for either. Um, and, and so another question is, how do we use a leadership circle profile as a, uh, as a coaching tool? So I can only answer it for me, what I do, and I think it'd be similar for, uh, for Joel, and, and that is that it's foundational. So when a, when a uh, client calls and they wanna talk about um, kind of what's on their mind, so we have, I would call it a chemistry call, just to see, you know, or do we line up well for one another? And I just listen like I would in a new patient interview, trying to understand where, where the potential client's at. And if it looks like we line up on what they want and what I think I could help them do, the first thing I ask them to do is, uh, is to do a leadership circle profile. So we set it up and then we uh, get 12 to 15 of the most important people in their life to agree to, to do the profile. They complete it and then I debrief it. And so after it's completed, which is a few weeks later, then we have a session where they have a copy of the report. I have a copy of the report and then we debrief it. And I start off with just asking them what they see. What are they surprised by? Uh, where do they see themselves strong and, and where do they not? Where are the gaps between how they evaluated themselves and how other people see them? So, and it's a tool that we continue to use because we go back to it to see how, um, what kind of progress is being made and how are their current situations uh, affecting it. So, I have a client that a month or so ago needed to uh, let go a hygienist that had worked in this practice for a long time. And it was a big deal that he took months to make that decision. Uh, he made the right one in my view, but we use the leadership circle profile and where his strengths and weaknesses are as a way to help prepare him to make those kind of decisions. Um, so uh, where do I learn more about the Leadership Circle Profile graphic? You can come to lineupsitecoaching.com and you'll see some of it there on our website. You can email me and we will, um, um, I'll, I'll talk to you about, uh, about what, what's in there and what it means and that kind of a thing. Um, you can go to the Leadership Circle Profile website itself and it'll have a lot of information or I would be happy to email you some brochures and more information about it. Um, so, so there's a lot of different ways. Uh, I'm a, you can tell I'm a big fan. I, I, I just won't coach somebody without doing that now because I feel like we, we're, we're not being effective. And for the cost of it, it's a bargain. Um, another question was, uh, from someone that went through E1 to E3 and is struggling to find a vision for themselves and for their practice. Is this common? Uh, and with a comment, uh, I feel like without a vision, I am just going uh, day by day at work. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, it's not necessarily common to somebody going E1 through E3. It's just common period. Because if we, if we, surveyed a thousand dentists and really got detailed about which one of them have um, a um, um, a clear vision of the future where they want to go what they want to do it would be a small percentage of them unfortunately um, most people just kind of live in that day-to-day kind of world um, so i think it takes work and that's where i think it really takes somebody else sometimes to help you to see that. Uh, and, and I think uh, forming a small study club, a small leadership learning group, especially if you have the opportunity to do it with some kind of leadership, uh, I think can, uh, can make a difference. So, so yes, it's common. And yes, I think without a vision, it is just kind of a day-to-day -day work kind of thing. And we all go through periods where we struggle with that. So just to be clear, uh, nobody's immune from those feelings. We, we, I have had that, we all have that. 
Um, and again, that's where I think um, another person comes in. So as an example, my partner, Joel, was my first coach before I went to coaching continuum. And one of the values of having Joel as a coach is he could see things in me I couldn't see myself. And he could light a fire in things uh, in me that would not have happened on my own. And he challenged me to things. So the tools of a coach are support and challenge. And so Joel did both of those things for me. And as a result, since then, I've had my best practice years, my most fulfilling practice years, published a book, become a coach, started another business. So it was all because people around me, especially Joel, uh, could see things in me that I couldn't see in myself. Um, so another question would be, how uh, would I counsel a new practitioner in choosing a coach? What background or education level should he or she be looking and listening for during the interview? So that's a great question. And, um, and, and I think the first thing is um, a coach, when we think about coaches, uh, we often think about an athletic coach or a skill coach who's going to teach us and transmit skills to us. And in my view, in my training, that's not the behavior of a coach. A behavior of a coach is that he's, he or she starts off believing that, first of all, that you really have your solutions and your answers are just not clear to you. And so a good coach is going to be a good question asker. It's going to be a very good listener and listens at a deep level, not only to the words you use, but the emotions that you express and the references you make. So I think we're looking for first is somebody whose style is like that. And then um, Joel and I went to the University of Texas at Dallas and went through their uh, executive and professional coaching program. Now, we did a certificate level, not a degree level, but I, and that is sanctioned by the International Coaching Federation. So I think somebody that aligns themselves that way is, um, is what you're looking for, because I think you'll get a real coach. A lot of people use the word coach. But, but they're really a teacher or a consultant, which are both great things and very helpful, but, but a coach is different than a mentor, a teacher, or a consultant. So at the Pank Institute, I get to do kind of all those things, and it's a lot of fun, but, but a coach is different than that. So um, another resource, my, my good friend Sherry Kay, who's I think teaching right now today, uh, helped to teach a, a class at the Pank Institute uh, on business development. Uh, Sherry's a formerly trained coach like Joel and I. Uh, she's also a consultant, but she is somebody who's credentialed and experienced and trained. And, and uh, Sherry's biggest strength is connection. She, she listens at a deep level. She connects with people at a deep level and she hears beyond your words. And those are the qualities of a great coach. That's how my coaches are, including Joel. So, so I hope that's helpful. But what I would say is for anybody, if you want to communicate with me um, about, um, about coaching or leadership or whatever, then just email me and, and I'd be happy to schedule a time just to chat or we can talk by email because that is why, um, that's why I exist. You know, I love doing that with, uh, with people that are really interested in moving their lives forward. Um, kind of final <clears throat> question that I can see here um, is, uh, is the Panky group con contemplating forming a leadership group? It seems it would make perfect sense since we share so much in common. Well, um, I'm not sure. I, I think the Panky Institute would love to do that. Uh, Dr. Brady has a lot of initiatives going on right now and a lot of new things coming out. Um, I think they would love to do that. I will tell you that Joel and I are forming leadership groups. We're, we're trying to put together small cohorts of around eight to 10 people that would go through a 12 month uh, leadership learning group together. We call leader to leader. Um, and it would be a combination of in-person online and individual one-on-one -on -one coaching. So we are doing that. Um, and I, I know Dr. Brady and our uh, board would love to have those kind of groups. Um, it's just, I know there, there are a lot of initiatives now that are, that are going on. So <clears throat> Joel and I are doing that. Um, 
and we would love to talk with you about that. So you can just reach out uh, to me at Mac at Linusac Coaching and we can talk some more about that. Um, if you already have your own group and you want a little help with that, then same thing. Because I, I, I think that you're spot on and that, that um, like-minded people who are attempting to do something very challenging and all of you that are attempting to practice at this level or attempting something really challenging, you need to do it together. Um, I mean, I've heard a number of Navy SEALs speak and talk to them and they all say that the critical piece is, you know, having a band of brothers or sisters to do this with. And I see that in, in Panky classes that the, that the follow-up is uh, the, the, them sharing with one another their ups and downs and having somebody that really understands is just critical. So, so reach out to me and we'll talk some more about it. I'll promise you this, that if Dr. Brady and our, um, our leadership group decides to do this, we will let everybody know because <laughs> we'll want it to be really successful. And I think it would be a perfect niche for, for the Panky Institute um, to venture into. So we're at, 8.03, and I don't see any other, um, <clears throat> any other questions. Um, so thanks again for being here. Uh, I, have, uh, I am very extraordinarily thankful for my Panky journey and all that it's done for me. I wouldn't be here tonight doing this without that. So, so I'm in for, uh, for as long as I can be in on contributing to the Institute. And thanks to everybody for being here.